A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar Ayer's Academy for the date 21st of June 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. So without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Let us start our discussion with this text in context article. It talks about El Salvador's Bitcoin. See the article says that most citizens of El Salvador have been reluctant to adopt bitcoin as a medium of exchange that is for using us money also the article mainly talks about the crash in the price of bitcoin from around $69000 in November last year to around $20000 this week see this has caused losses to the investors around the world and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us discuss about the el salvador's government's current status after the adoption of bitcoin as an official currency but before that the syllabus relevant to the article is given here for your reference please go through it see as we already saw the crash in the price of bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies has put el salvador's government in trouble and why this crash has caused trouble for the government here is the answer for this question see the president of el salvador is a self proclaimed fan of cryptocurrencies so he adopted bitcoin as an official currency from last year september that is 2021 september let's take a quick detour here and let us understand about the country el salvador see it is a central american country led by the president nayib bukele Now as a part of our prelims preparation take a look at this map to know about the central american countries it includes guatemala belize el salvador honduras nicaragua costa rica panama so these countries comprise central america now coming back to our discussion what is the trouble the trouble is the crash in the price of bitcoin as we already saw the price crashed from $69000 to $20000 So what are all the consequences of this trouble? Firstly, this has raised concerns over the government's ability to repay its debt. A crash in the Bitcoin's price against the US dollar means that the government will have to sell its Bitcoin for fewer dollars, thus affecting its capacity to repay dollar debt. See why is it significant because the El Salvador government has made an investment of over 100 million dollars in bitcoin and also president bukele has been using tax payers money to bet on bitcoin and now you understand how much this government is dependent on bitcoin and because of this crash it has lost more than half of its investment value till date So this is the first consequence secondly this has caused losses to investors around the world since the price has crashed from $69000 to $20000 this is a huge loss for the investors and thirdly it affected the ability of el salvador government from getting financial help from the international monetary fund and the world bank see these borrowings are mainly to help meet the government's spending needs so these three are the consequences of the trouble that the el salvador government are in now what are those it affected the government's ability to repay the debt it caused losses to the investors around the world and it affected the ability of el salvador government from getting financial help from imf and the world bank here comes the question why did el salvador adopt bitcoin as an official currency in the first place See, in the year 2001, El Salvador had adopted the US dollar as its official currency. And from last year September, that is 2021 September, the Bitcoin was also adopted as an official currency. So, now the El Salvador can use both Bitcoin and the US dollar as official currencies. And in order to promote Bitcoin, the El Salvador government has been trying to encourage citizens to primarily use Bitcoin for their daily transactions it even came out with the payments wallet named chivo which gave out for free bitcoin worth 30 dollars initially see all these are done to encourage people to use bitcoin in transactions and this is how bitcoin was adopted as an official currency but now the question is what is the core reason behind this adoption of bitcoin as an official currency see the analysts believe that it is to do with the el salvador's government inability to borrow in us dollars 
See, there is inability in borrowing because the El Salvador's public debt has risen to over 100% of gross domestic product. And also, it is believed that greater adoption of Bitcoin in El Salvador will allow the government to impose tax and to spend in Bitcoins instead of US dollars. So, as an alternative to US dollars, the El Salvador government attempted to borrow $1 billion using bonds backed by Bitcoin. But they failed. See, the government bonds are trading at a steep discount. This means that the bond is sold lower than its face value. For example, take a $1,000 bond. If it is sold at $800, then it is said that it is sold at a discount. So, as a result of this discounted selling, they are classified as junk by the investors. Now, lastly, let us discuss why people are reluctant in adopting Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. One big reason for the low acceptance of Bitcoin has been their extreme price volatility. See, people always like to invest in assets whose price keep on rising. So, this makes them an unreliable store of value. So, people in general are hesitant to accept something as money if they are not fairly sure about its value in the future. Right? So, this is why people are reluctant in adopting Bitcoin as a medium of exchange for their daily transactions. And with this, we have come to the end. Now, let's have a quick recap. We saw about the Central American countries, which includes Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama. And after that, we saw the trouble that El Salvador government is going through, which is the crash in the price of Bitcoin. And we saw the consequences of this trouble, which includes concerns over the government's ability to repay its debt, losses to the investors around the world, inability of the government from getting financial help from the IMF and the World Bank. And after that, we saw why El Salvador government adopted Bitcoin as an official currency. See, in the year 2001, it adopted US dollar as an official currency. And in the year 2021, it adopted Bitcoin as the official currency. And the reason behind this adoption of Bitcoin as an official currency is the inability of the government to borrow in US dollars. This is because the public debt has risen to over 100% of GDP. So, as an alternative to US dollars, in the year 2021, the government adopted Bitcoin as the official currency. But this has backfired. Since the price crash, the government bonds are selling at a discount rate. And hence, the government bonds are classified as junk by the investors. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing why people are reluctant in adopting Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. This is because of their extreme price volatility. So, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, let us take up this editorial article for discussion. It is written in the backdrop of a recent judgment by Allahabad High Court. See, it dealt with the misuse of a provision in the Indian Penal Code that is IPC. And to curtail the misuse of that provision, the High Court has given certain directions. But the author is of opinion that the directions are stepping on the legislative sphere and it will affect the victims more. So, in this discussion, let us understand which provision is misused and why. And we'll also see the directions and some solutions on how to curtail the misuse of that provision. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is given here for your reference. Please go through it. See, before going into the case details, let us know which provision we are talking about. It is the Section 498A of IPC and it deals with cruelty against women by her husband or his relatives. See, here cruelty would mean two things. One is hurting the woman physically or mentally through any willful conduct. Such conduct includes causing grave injury to the woman or causing danger to the life or limp of the woman or even causing danger to mental or physical health of the woman. It also includes the conduct that drives the woman to commit suicide. So, all these are considered as cruelty done by husband or his relatives. But note that the definition of the cruelty does not end here because any harassment done to coerce the woman or a person related to her to meet any unlawful demand for a property or valuable security will also constitute cruelty. See, unlawfully demanding property or valuable security means demanding dowry, right? So, that means 
coercing a woman or anyone related to her for extracting dowry is cruelty under this section so these are the two things that would constitute as cruelty now all these acts or conducts of cruelty are punishable under the section with imprisonment from 1 to 3 years with or without fine also know that offences under section 498a is non bailable and a cognizable offence cognizable offence here means that the accused can be arrested without a warrant see you should know that the section 498a was inserted into ipc in 1983 only it was a period when dowry deaths were increasing here remember that in 1961 itself the dowry prohibition act was enacted but its main purpose was to prohibit giving or taking of dowry so it defined dowry and listed out the penalties for giving or taking of dowry it did not take into cognizance that often dowry demand leads to widespread harassment and horrific acts of violence disguised as domestic abuse against the married women by the in-laws sometimes it also resulted in murder of the married women therefore there was a need to deal with all such cruelty done by in-laws and finally the section was inserted for this purpose so overall the purpose behind section 498a was to deal with dowry related harassment and unnatural deaths an additional information for you here even though section 498a existed it was not enough in the case of death due to dowry so in the year 1986 a new offence called dowry death was created in ipc under section 304b and the punishment was intensified to imprisonment for minimum 7 years and maximum life imprisonment now coming back to section 498a from the moment the section was enacted until now this section has been increasingly vilified that is berated the vilification was due to the potential of misusing the section for making fake allegations even now those who oppose the section argue that married women frequently misuse it and use it as a weapon against their in-laws because it is non bailable and cognizable offence well we cannot deny the fact that misuse sometimes happen there are some women who wrongly file cases as a vengeance and taking revenge on in-laws and citing this reason many petitions have been filed in the court of law to dilute the section now let us see those various stands of supreme court benches in this matter one of the important cases is rajesh sharma and others versus state of up 2017 this judgment diluted section 498a and even the offence was practically made bailable actually this judgment changed the procedural aspect of section 498a and it effectively prohibited the arrest of accused persons and how did this happen see in the judgment supreme court bench provided an eight point direction direction 1 was the most contentious one that is disputable see it was disputable because it, it directed the district legal services authorities to constitute one or more family welfare committees in every district The purpose of the committee was to look into compliance under section 498a. It will interact with the parties and submit a report within one month from the date of receipt of complaint. The issue was not looking into the complaints, but it was with the clause which prohibited the arrest of the accused person until the report is submitted. So from this we can say that for one month the accused will be free from arrest. Another direction of the Supreme Court. made the offence practically bailable because the direction states that if a bail application is received then it should be decided on the same day whether to grant bail or not so these two were the main dilution of section 498a because now the non bailable and the cognizable nature that acted as a deterrent to the offender was gone see the purpose behind the direction was to manage the fake allegations but while doing that the judgment diluted the section itself but thankfully the same was realized by supreme court in another case whose judgment came a year later after the previous judgment the case was social action forum for manav adhikar versus union of india 2018 in this case law supreme court modified many of the directions given in the rajesh sharma case 
mainly it held that the directions pertaining to family welfare committee and its constitution is impermissible the decision was arrived at based on various factors the first one is supreme court found that constituting the family welfare committee is beyond the code of criminal procedure the duties of the committee do not conform to any provision of crpc according to supreme court so in this way the committee will be a third agency which cannot be allowed under the law secondly supreme court recognized that while drafting section 498a legislature knowingly made it cognizable and non bailable so these natures of the section should not be changed by the court and thirdly it held that the misuse of section happens due to fault made by the investigating agency see the investigating agency does not look into facts clearly and jumps into action without the application of mind so if the investigating agency functions diligently then the misuse of section 498a can be curtailed so supreme court after modifying the directions in rajesh kumar case asked the investigating officers to be guided by the principles stated in various case laws let us see these case laws and principles in brief first comes the 1996 case joginder kumar vs state of uttar pradesh the principle is with respect to arrest of persons see the supreme court held that arrest should not be made due to the suspicion of complicity in an offence rather it should be done with reasonable satisfaction and justification this is to be achieved only after investigation into the genuineness and bona fides of a complaint secondly the arrest principle was again reiterated in another case in 1997 called the dk basu versus state of west bengal here supreme court laid down certain guidelines as to when where and how arrest should be made and what procedure to be followed and the next one is lalita kumari versus government of uttar pradesh 2014 case law in this case the constitution bench suggested that preliminary enquiry may be held in matrimonial or family disputes the preliminary enquiry is to ascertain whether it is a cognizable offence or not and the next important judgment is 2014 case arnesh kumar versus state of bihar and another see this is a landmark judgment regarding section 498a because it dealt with the misuse of section here supreme court provided eight golden principles or directions for arresting person under the section mainly it noted that the police should not automatically arrest unless it satisfies the criteria under section 41 of crpc see section 41 is the provision that deals with the circumstances under which arrest can be made without warrant that is the circumstances that becomes cognizable offenses and i have given the eight golden principles or guidelines for making arrest under the section 498a so you just go through it so far we have seen six case laws now let us come to the allahabad high court case it was again a case related to section 498a mainly here the high court laid down directions similar to rajesh kumar case totally 14 directions have been given let us see the two main ones one is constituting the family welfare committee in each district like in the case of rajesh kumar see composition functions and duties have been prescribed in the direction and almost they are similar to the ones in the rajesh kumar case and the second one is instituting the cooling period see cooling period refers to the two months from lodging of fir or complaint so in this period it is prohibited to arrest the accused or even take police action to nab the accused this is because like in rajesh kumar case the case will be referred to the family welfare committee so these are the two important directions given by the allahabad high court recently so what is the author saying about this see author has recognized the noble intent behind the directions which is to curb the misuse of section 498a and another noble intent is to provide certain safeguards to innocent in laws of married women who make fake allegations but at the same time author also criticizes these directions because they are flawed mainly as we saw in the social action forum for manav adhikar versus union of india case supreme court changed the directions given in rajesh kumar case it did not allow for constitution of 
family welfare committees stating that they do not conform with the law supreme court also held that a prohibition on arrest is not permissible so now like the rajesh kumar case another direction is given by the allahabad high court so the author notes that this judgment will be struck down secondly high court has increased the arrest prohibition period that is the cooling period from 1 month to 2 months see it was 1 month in the rajesh kumar case this is also a concern pointed out by the author and after this author also notes that the directions potentially fall in the sphere of legislature he also worries that these directions might curtail the rights of a genuine victim of dowry harassment and due to this author concludes with suggestions to check the false dowry cases first suggestion is to strictly enforce direction given in 2014 arnesh kumar case and this will enable to obtain sufficient and credible material before arrest the second suggestion is to make the offence bailable for this the help of legislation is needed and the third suggestion is to make the offence compoundable the compoundable offences are those where the victim can enter into a compromise with the accused and they may also agree to drop the charges this will save the cost to the parties and save the court's time also see this suggestion is based on the fact that often fake section 498a cases are filed out because of anger on in laws so if compromise is allowed they may solve the issue so the conclusion is these suggestions may be implemented by keeping in mind that dowry debts and harassment are still continuing in the 21st century and with this we have come to the end of the discussion in this discussion we saw about section 498a of indian penal code it deals with cruelty against a woman by her husband or his relatives the cruelty includes hurting women physically mentally causing grave injury causing danger to life or limb or causing danger to physical or mental health it even includes the conduct that drives the woman to commit suicide Another aspect of cruelty is that it includes harassment done to coerce the woman or a person related to her by unlawfully demanding property or valuable security and under the section the cruelty is punishable with imprisonment from 1 to 3 years with or without fine note that it is a non bailable and a cognizable offence now after this we saw why the section 498a was inserted it is to deal with the dowry related harassment and unnatural deaths and we saw about a new offence called dowry death which was created in 1986 and included in ipc under section 304b and the punishment was intensified to imprisonment for a minimum 7 years to life imprisonment and following that we saw various stands of supreme court benches in the matter we saw about the case rajesh sharma and others versus state of up 2017 we saw that in this judgment the section 498a was diluted it directed district legal services authorities to constitute family welfare committees in every district and it said that arrest was prohibited until the report is submitted by the committee and it also made the offence bailable and after this we saw about the social action forum for manavadika versus union of india 2018 in this judgment supreme court stated that constituting family welfare committee is beyond the code of criminal procedure so it does not conform to the law and it recognized that legislature knowingly made the offence cognizable and non bailable so it should not be changed by the court and it held that misuse of the section happens due to fault made by the investigating agency and following this we saw various case laws which provided guidelines or principles for the investigating officers we saw about jogender kumar versus state of up 1996 case we saw about dk basu versus state of west bengal 1997 case and after that we saw about lalita kumari versus government of uttar pradesh 2014 case and finally we saw 2014 case arnesh kumar versus state of bihar and another this landmark judgment dealt with the section 498a and its misuse in this judgment supreme court provided eight golden principles or directions for arresting the person under the section and after this we saw about the recent allahabad high court case which again reiterated the directions given in the rajesh kumar case 
we saw that the high court asked to constitute family welfare committees in each district and we saw that the arrest prohibition period was increased from 1 month to 2 months and finally we ended our discussion by seeing the suggestions given by the author in this editorial the first one is to strictly enforce direction given in 2014 arnesh kumar case and the second one is to make the offence bailable and the third suggestion is to make the offence compoundable and with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion look at this news article it talks about the order of election commission see the election commission ordered the deletion of 111 registered but unrecognized political parties because the election commission found these party to be non existent and also the election commission referred three of the parties to the department of revenue and this is for the legal action for involving in serious financial impropriety and this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us discuss the conditions necessary for the declaration of a party to be a national party and regional party firstly let us take the conditions for the national party see there are certain conditions for the declaration of a particular party to be a national party of india let us see those conditions one by one firstly at the last general election to house of people that is lok sabha or to the state legislative assembly the party should secure at least 6% of the valid votes polled in any four or more states and in addition to this the party should win at least four seats in the lok sabha from any of the state or states so this is the first condition and the second condition is that at the last general election the party should win at least 2 percentage seats in the lok sabha that is 11 seats in the existing house having 543 members and these members should be elected from at least 3 different states so out of these 11 seats the member should be elected from at least 3 different states and this is condition number 2 and finally the party should be recognized as state party in at least four states so these are the three conditions that are necessary for declaring a party to be a national political party now coming to the conditions for declaring a party as state political party the first condition includes at the last general election to the state legislative assembly the party should secure at least 6% of the total valid votes and in addition to this it should win at least two seats to the legislative assembly of the state concerned and this is condition number 1 and at the last general election to the lok sabha from the state the party should secure at least 6% of the total valid votes and in addition to this the party should win at least one seat to the lok sabha from that state at general election so if the election is to the legislative assembly of the state the condition is that it should have secured 6% of the total valid votes plus at least two seats and if the election is to lok sabha the condition is that the party should have secured at least 6% of the total valid votes plus at least one seat to the lok sabha this is condition number 2 Now coming to condition number 3 at the last general election to the legislative assembly of the state the party should win at least 3% of the total number of seats in the legislative assembly or at least 3 seats in the assembly whichever is more see firstly we saw about the percentage of votes polled but here it is about the percentage of total number of seats now the next condition is that at the last general election to lok sabha the party should return at least one member to the house of people that is lok sabha for every 25 members so this is the condition for lok sabha and finally at the last general election to the lok sabha or state legislative assembly the candidate of the party should secure at least 8% of the total valid votes and these are the conditions necessary for declaring a party as state political party see there are so many conditions but at least any one of the conditions should be fulfilled for declaring a party as national party and state political party and with this we have come to the end let us have a quick recap we saw the conditions necessary for declaring a party as national political party which is 
at the last general election to lok sabha or state legislative assembly the party should secure at least 6 percentage of valid votes in any four or more states in addition to this it should win at least four seats in the lok sabha from any of the states the second condition is that at the last general election it should win at least 2 percentage of seats in the lok sabha that is 11 seats out of 543 and the members should be elected from at least 3 different states and finally the party should be recognized as state party in at least 4 states and if any one of these 3 conditions are fulfilled then the party is declared as national political party now coming to state political party conditions at the last general election to legislative assembly of the state, the party should secure 6 percentage of the valid votes and addition to that it should win at least 2 seats in the legislative assembly. The second condition is that at the last general election to Lok Sabha, the party should secure at least 6 percentage of valid votes polled. In addition to that, it should win at least 1 seat to Lok Sabha from that state. And the third condition is that at the last general election to legislative assembly of the state, the party should win at least 3 percentage of the total number of seats or at least 3 seats in the general assembly, whichever is more. And the next condition is that at the last general election to Lok Sabha from the state, the party should return at least one member to the Lok Sabha for every 25 members. And finally, at the last general election to Lok Sabha or Legislative Assembly of the state, the candidate said by the party should have secured at least 8% of the total valid votes. And if any one of these conditions are fulfilled, then the party is declared as state political party. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now let us take up this final article for a discussion. See this news article talks about 5G technology. According to the news article, the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, along with the Army Training Command, will be establishing a 5G test bed at the Military College of Telecommunication Engineering in Indore. And this is done to facilitate the use of 5G technology for the Army along the borders. And apart from this, this project will also enable students and trainees at the college to be thoroughly familiar with the advanced technologies embedded in the 5G system. So in this context, let us understand what is this 5G technology and some of its unique features in prelims perspective. Firstly, what is 5G? See, it is nothing but the fifth generation mobile network. As you know, the cellular communication networks are known by their numeric generation. For example, 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G and now 5G. So here the G stands for generation. So what do they mean by a generation? See, while connected to the internet, the speed of your connection is determined by the signal strength. See, it is shown next to the signal bar on your home screen in the alphabetical order such as 2G, 3G, 5G and so on. And each generation is defined as a set of telephone network standards that describe how a specific mobile phone system is implemented technologically. Here, as our internet speed requirement changes, the technology used to achieve that speed also changes. For example, 1G provides 2.4 kilobytes per second, 2G provides 64 kilobytes per second. See, these are all speeds. And 3G provides 144 kbps to 2 mbps, that is megabytes. And 4G provides 100 Mbps to 1 Gbps, that is gigabytes. And know that 4G is based on LTE technology. And the next upgrade is the 5G. See, you can see the evolution of cellular communication networks in the image given here. We are currently fully deployed in 4G with the 5G gaining ground. See, what is so special about 5G? See, a defining capability of 5G is that it is designed for forward compatibility that is it caters to the ability to flexibly support future services that are unknown today or in simple terms 5g enables a new kind of network that is designed to connect virtually everyone and everything together including missions objects and devices see 5g wireless technology is meant to deliver higher multi gbps peak data speeds ultra low latency 
Here latency is the time it takes for a data to pass from one point on a network to another. So ultra low latency means a computer network is optimized to process a high volume of data with minimal delay. And it is meant to deliver more reliability, massive network capacity and a more uniform user experience to more users. See here, higher performance and improved efficiency empower the new user experiences and they connect new industries. And more importantly, 5G technology has three unique applications. The first one is enhanced mobile broadband. See, in addition to making our smartphones better, 5G mobile technology can usher in new immersive experiences such as VR and AR. See, here VR is virtual reality and AR is augmented reality. So, they can usher in new immersive experiences such as VR and AR with faster, more uniform data rates and lower latency and lower cost per bit. Secondly, with ultra-reliable, accessible, low-latency networks, 5G can enable new services that can transform industries such as remote control of critical infrastructure, automobiles and medical procedures. And finally is the massive IoT. It is the Internet of Things. See, 5G is meant to seamlessly connect a massive number of embedded sensors in virtually everything and they provide low-cost connectivity solutions. And that's all about this 5G technology. In this discussion, we saw what is 5G. It is nothing but a fifth generation mobile network and G here stands for generation. And we saw what is a generation. See, generation is defined as a set of telephone network standards that describe how a specific mobile phone is implemented technologically. So what does this mean? It means that with changing internet speed requirement, the technology used to achieve that speed also changes. We saw examples for that. 1G provides 2.4 kbps, 2G provides 64 kbps, 3G provides 144 kbps to 2 mbps, 4G provides 100 mbps to 1 gbps. And the next upgrade in this line is 5G. And after that, we saw some of the characteristics of 5G. It delivers high multi-GBPS peak data speeds. It delivers ultra-low latency. It delivers more reliability, massive network capacity and more uniform user experience. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing applications of 5G technology. The first one is enhanced mobile broadband. And the next one is transforming industries through 5G such as remote control of critical infrastructure, automobiles and medical procedures. And the final one is connecting massive Internet of Things. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of our discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. We have two prelims questions today for practice. I'll solve one of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Take this first question here. Consider the following statements. A party should win at least 2% of seats in the House of People to be declared as a state party. Statement 2. A party should win at least 2 seats in the State Legislative Assembly to be declared as a national party. Which of the above statements is or are incorrect? So you have to identify the incorrect statements here. See, this is the quiz question for you. Try to remember the discussion that we had and attempt this question and post your answer in the comment section. Moving to the next question, with reference to communication technologies, what are the differences between LTE and VoLT? That is long term evolution and voice over long term evolution. Statement 1 LTE is commonly marketed as 3G and VoLT is commonly marketed as advanced 3G. See, this statement is incorrect. LTE is commonly marketed as 4G LTE and VoLT is technology update to LTE protocol. So the statement 1 is incorrect. See LTE is data only technology and VoLTE is voice only technology. See the second statement is also incorrect. Under LTE the infrastructure of telecom players only allows transmission of data while voice calls are routed to their older 2G or 3G networks. And this is why under LTE you cannot access your 4G data services while you are on call. And this leads to problems such as slow internet speeds and poor voice clarity. 
See, VoLT allows voice calls to be packaged and carried through LTE networks, and this means that 4G data can be accessed even during calls. So the statement two is incorrect here. So the correct option to this question is option D, neither one nor two. I've given two main question here for your practice. So interested aspirants, write it and post your answer in the comment section. And if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share, and comment, and do subscribe to Shankar Ayer's Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.